Okay, now. And you started from here, Sally. All right. Well, first of all, uh, thank you all for being here. I am delighted to be here hosting you with Imam Shamsi. Um, it is a privilege and an honor to be talking to all of you today. As our subject is so important to all of us, um, the world has been suffering so much and we are coming out of a major pandemic that had affected all of us. And it showed us the past few years that we are one world. We are all connected together. And so we have to work together. It is so important to be able to uh, just leave all the bigotry and the hatred away from us and be responsible for our action and communicate with each other in the, in the same way that we want to communicate with ourselves. Uh, the history of this um, week, I am sure you know it, but I will refresh it for you. It was first talked about the World Interfaith Harmony Week, first proposed at the United Nations General Assembly on September 23, 2010, by His Majesty King Abdullah II of Jordan. Just under a month later, on October 20, 2010, was unanimously adopted by the United Nations. And the first week of February of every year will be observed as the World Interfaith Harmony Week. So the commandment that was added to it, it was two commandments by adding love of the good and love of thy neighbor. This formula includes all people of goodwill. It includes those of other faiths and those with no faith. So I'm delighted to be here with you. And we have amazing speakers that I will be introducing to you and they're all very accomplished and they have the right energy, the right spirit and the right heart to be able to guide us and work with us. Let me start by introducing Rabbi Robert Bob Kaplan. He is the founding director of the Center for Community Leadership a JCRC New York. He is also a member of the New York City Human Rights Commission and Justice and Human Rights. So please welcome with me Rabbi Robert Kaplan. Well, thank you so much. <clears throat> and it's my distinct honor uh, to be with you all this evening. And certainly the message of how we're going to navigate some of the difficulties that are sitting in front of us. Um, someone that I came into contact with during the literally during the height of COVID, his name is Peter Coleman. He is the chair of the Morton Deutsch Center on Conflict Resolution at, at uh, Columbia University, wrote a book called The Way Out. Uh, it is an exposition of how, certainly within the United States and worldwide as well, that we are in a position right now in the world of toxic polarity. In other words, there have always been differing sides. There's always been people that didn't agree with each other. There's always been um, one side looking at the other side is not necessarily having the, the full truth or having the, the ability to have the full truth, yet there was an increasing level for many, many years, for decades, of acceptance of alternative um, narratives and ways of approaching uh, a way of building a society together. What Professor Coleman wrote in his book was that over the past 50 years, 
more increasingly, that notion of lending dignity to another's narrative has not only dissipated, it has practically disappeared. In fact, we have gotten to the point where we see the other in society, not in terms of merely owning or living by a different narrative, but as being a, an enemy or a destructive force in the context of the world that we live in. We no longer can lend dignity to the other's narrative. We now are looking at the other's narrative as being something that is in fact dismantling our narrative. And therefore it is not just uh, someone that we may think differently of, yet will work with in the context of building a better society together, the other is now a destructive force that needs to be somehow eradicated from the public scene. And we have seen this build and build and build in the context of our society. And as mentioned, I am from New York. We have seen the level of hate crimes, of seeing the other in such a destructive way rise and rise and rise in the context of what is now a, a literally epidemic, fortunately not on the level of the pandemic, but an epidemic of hate that has become acceptable within the context of society. What once was literally unacceptable, uh, people would uh, may have had ideas that were based in racism, anti-Semitism, and Islamophobia, and other kinds of hatreds, they were often loath or uh, reluctant to utilize them or to speak of them publicly. That barrier, unfortunately, has been lost. And because of the loss of that barrier, and the way that some, and I'm trying, I will, I will say that I'm not being political whatsoever, well, some in society have used this kind of hatred as a political tool in order to push certain agendas or have used it as a societal tool and in, in, in ways of getting the kinds of resources or kinds of things in society that they, re, they require and the others, others may not, or seeing their narrative as being the narrative that, that they feel society must work by. Unfortunately, because of this type of uh, direction that we're going in, what happens is often those who um, are looking for direction or feeling afraid or feeling alienated for society will literally choose up a side. And uh, according to, for instance, the uh, New, York, uh, New York Police Department's Hate Crimes Bureau, at least a third or more of the hate crimes that are perpetrated in the city of New York today are perpetrated by people with severe mental illness with the full recognition that it's not that they wake up in the morning and necessarily hate someone from another faith group or another uh, uh, race group or another uh, way of looking at, at the world, they are influenced by the constant consistency of the mantra against the other, the destructive mantra against the other. And because they have and are suffering from often severe mental illness, act upon it. And sometimes those acts are, well, they can be people defacing a house of worship or shooting mass shootings that are happening in our country today, in the United States today. Or, and what I find very sad, last night I was part of a gathering of faith leaders in Brooklyn. It was organized by an organization called the God Squad, the 67 Priests and Clergy Council. And it was a, a gathering of those who are survivors of gun violence in the context of our society. I'm not talking about those who have survived the mass shootings that uh, readily make it into the media 
This is the gun violence that happens on a consistent basis in communities throughout New York and throughout the United States, where young men, generally young men, see guns and shooting people as a problem solving process. They see shooting someone or eliminating their life, as, as horrible as that may be, as a problem solving process or a way of moving forward their personal agenda or their community, their organizations or their their what they feel is the agenda of some club or gang or whatever. I was in the room with close to 50 families, 50 survivors of gun violence. Now that doesn't mean that the gun violence has necessarily happened against them. They are there because they've lost a, a dear and loved one to the tragedy of gun violence in society. Yet we were there together as faith leaders, Christians, Jews, Muslims, Hindus, others, in order to give them our prayers and our love, to help them to navigate the horrific world that they have, that has been created for them, to give them hope. The difference is, in fact, they gave us hope when they or the representatives of the group came up to speak to us, they spoke of hope, they spoke of loss, they spoke of unbearable loss sometimes, but they also spoke of hope. And one person, a mother, spoke of her son that she has lost to gun violence in Brooklyn, and her blessing to us our blessing to us that are not part of her club of survivors is that we should not become part of her club. We should not become those who are affected by the horrendousness of hate that evidence itself through someone seeing the other as less than human and shooting them and killing them <clears throat> and so their entire family and the world that they lived in, their friends, their loved ones, were bereft of that soul, not only at that moment, but forever. And as we travel around the world, we see similar types of incidents or beliefs that we're going to solve problems through a gun. What is happening today in the Ukraine is absolutely horrible and horrendous it is difficult in the morning to even watch the pain and suffering that is happening to families to loved ones on both sides of the conflict the hundreds of thousands now of those who were forced into or have become um, combatants killed in during this past year of conflict in the ukraine those who wake up in their homes relatively secure or feeling relatively secure, less so now than ever, having a cup of coffee, a cup of tea, enjoying the love of their family, yeah. all of a sudden a horrendous missile hits their building and lives are snuffed out. So I'm going to go back to that gathering of last night. Who brought together that gathering? It was leaders of faith. It was faith leaders from different walks of life who have decided that their faith has told them explicitly that this not just is not that that this should be less, that this must end, and that through their faith, they're going to dedicate their lives and their actions, their prayers, but more than their prayers, they kept emphasizing their actions to end the scourge of gun violence. What I took away from that evening was not only a great amount of sorrow, but a great amount of hope and a great amount of instruction. How that, I'm not sure how that happened, but okay. Um, how, how I as a faith leader need to act, that I need to 
search my own faith. I need to search my own connectivity to the common creator of us all and make a decision in my life that I will march with those who are dedicated towards ending hate and killing and destruction in the context of both our local communities and on the world scene. Without making that decision of faith, without seeing my strength come from our common creator, I am not able to get to the next step. Because one of the psalmists say, from whence does my strength come? Certainly from the Lord. However, I have seen my strength not only come from God directly, but by, by those who have risen up in their faith, in their dedication to their faith, to ensure that they become partners in ending this horrible plague of violence and inequity that has become so common in all of our lives. So my blessing to you is the blessing that I heard last night, that we should have the strength and the insight. We should have the partnership and we should have the capacity to end this hatred and violence, not just pray it away, but act it away, to stand up and say this is simply unacceptable and that as people of faith, we stand against it. We stand against it, we act against it, and we find partners in our world, such as those who are here today on this Zoom, in this virtual space, to become partners in ending, ending, not just lessening, but ending this epidemic of hate and violence that has so destroyed not only the sense of safety for many of us in the world, but the sense of hope for just those who have become the survivors of such horrendous acts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Kaplan. Um, it is such an amazing situation that we are living in, and I'm glad that we have people like you and the others that are here who care enough to put their effort and, and their energy on reaching out to everybody. Um, as we all know, the hate crime has been risen since last, from this year, from last year, 37% went up for all kinds of hate crime globally. So that means there's, we're having a major problems on our hand, and that's why we all should unite into trying to address that, no matter how we can address it, to be able, as you said, to eliminate it. For years, I have had events through our organization, and my only uh, um, request from everyone is to respect each other religion. Don't convert and don't love me or I love you. Respect each other and tolerate each other because we are all in the same world and we belong with each other. So thank you again. Now I have the honor and the privilege to introduce our second speaker. It's Reverend Chloe Breyer. She is the director of the Interfaith Center of New York. She is also Episcopalian priest and author of several books, mostly known as a woman activist and a human rights defender, Harvard graduate, a wife and a mother of two, a woman of my heart, Welcome, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much. And it is wonderful to be here uh, at World Interfaith Harmony Week. Thank you to Imam Shamsi Ali and the Nusan Tara or, um, Foundation 
for giving us all an opportunity to express interfaith work in all of its myriad of forms happening all around the world. And it's such an amazing opportunity to have this week in which we can share with each other. Because so often we're all doing very good work, but we don't all kind of are, mm -hmm. aren't able to connect. So I'm so grateful to this for this opportunity. I am the director of the Interfaith Center of New York that for the last quarter century has um, worked to raise up grassroots faith leaders of different faith traditions here in New York City and offer some civic uh, education. And so we do um, a lot of work right now. We're working with a lot of um, houses of worship around New York City that are um, offering support to migrants that are coming, um, you know, up across the border it's a it's a worldwide challenge i think for so many of us how do we offer hospitality as houses of worship and communities to brothers and sisters who are um trying to uh, build lives for themselves that's one kind of thing that we do we also um, work to educate teachers and police officers about the richness of religious diversity um, in our city and how important it is for democracy that we work together on shared concerns. The title of this program is the Interfaith Partnership for Peace and Justice, Ensuring Racial and Gender Equ Equality and, um, and uh, Eliminating Poverty. And so I want to focus the majority of my, my time here on um, something that has been deeply uh, personal for me um, that is a, a kind of expression of interfaith work that I have um, lived with since since really um, since 9-11 and since, you know, being a faith leader in this city when that, uh, you know, tragic and transformative event happened back in 2001 and being a chaplain to the school um, and having a lot of kids, uh, you know, be deeply affected by this event. And I can remember um, doing the funeral for or the service for uh, a, a woman who had lost her fiance in, this, in, the, in the World Trade Center uh, second tower and hearing her say, you know, there's got to be something that, good that comes out of this. There has to be a raising of consciousness and thinking, well, our, that, you know, at the time, how profound her words were and looking for that kind of um, raising of consciousness, which I think we all as people of faith look for when something tragic happens. Um, so I kept looking for that. And it wasn't going to be evident in our government's response. That became pretty clear as, uh, you know, as we went into the um, Iraq war and so forth. But, it, it, you know, this opportunity to kind of um, try to build trust between people came up a lot. And I would say in, in the following year, I worked with our church in the Diocese of New York to raise money to rebuild a mosque that had been bombed in Afghanistan. And that wow. began a kind of 20-year relationship um, that I, I embarked in um, with Afghanistan and building ties um, between faith traditions and also um, across countries. And occasionally went um, back, I would say maybe uh, 12 or 13 times for short trips over there to try to help with um, building some schools and, um, and health clinics. Now, I'm going to ask that we, um, I'm going to share a slide with you because um, we all know that, you know, uh, that when the United States uh, pulled out of Afghanistan in 2000, uh, in 2021, um, the, the, the government collapsed and many of the, um, the, you know, uh, people who had fought for so long to um, build the country were then threatened um, by the arrival of the Taliban. And so many women who we had encouraged um, as a country uh, and often support to were then faced um, a lot of, uh, of challenges. So um, what I want to share with you is a, a couple of slides that were um, the, the uh, report from a trip, an interfaith women's group that went to Afghanistan in March of this of last year. So that was maybe um, six or seven months after the Taliban had come to power and um, to kind of try to re-engage um, with some of the, the, the women and men uh, who we had worked with, all of us respectively, um, for so many years. So I'm now gonna share my screen. 
Um, and let's wish me luck on that. Here we go. Okay, so this is these are the groups of um, of people of organizations and um, uh, by and large American or American Afghan women who participated in a trip in March of 2021. Um, let's see. Yep, here we go. Um, this was uh, uh, the um, Daisy Khan, who was one of the um, American Muslim women that was part of this delegation, shared a, uh, a, a shared a document that had to do with it was the Declaration of Muslim Women's Rights um, with the Ministry okay. of Foreign Affairs of the. Um, of the de facto government. We don't think it probably went very far, but nonetheless, they, they received that. Um, and uh, so I'm now gonna actually try to, um, hang on one second. Okay, so we know that in Afghanistan, um, back in the fall, 47% of the population was in need of um, a lot of direct uh, uh, assistance for hunger. And that is 20 million people. That number has only increased since the winter time. And um, while much of the spotlight has, has changed from that country to other crises around the world, nonetheless, hunger is an enormous, enormous issue. And something like 90% of the country right now relies on um, humanitarian food assistance. This was a, a group of girls that we met with who were high school aged. And as you may remember that in March um, of last year, schools opened for girls ages uh, kindergarten through seventh grade, but high school age girls were not allowed to return to school. And that remains the same as today. So if we're talking about gender equity, um, this is one of the worst abuses of, um, of, of you know, of, of women's rights and dignities um, almost anywhere I can think of in an organized fashion around the world. So these girls have gathered much at the peril of, of their lives, but they are seeking to remain in community with one another. And there are some programs that are allowing them to do this. Um, this is a picture of girls from um, an organization called PARSA, which I encourage you to look up and um, support their work if you are if you feel so inclined. The next slide is uh, happened upon a, uh, again, this was March. So a time still of transition. There were graduations going on at that time. There are no longer, but these were young women medical students who, if you recall, women have to be treated by other women. Um, and so the idea that women are not able to get a high school or college education is condemning a generation of people um, yeah. to go through childbirth without medical assistance. So that's a, another um, a cause of concern. This was a meeting with the Ministry of Education, and you'll be interested to know because there were definitely factions within the the um, the Taliban and a more hardline group has come to power. Both these people are gone from their position um, as of now. Um, and these were the lines of people waiting for bread and the way that people continue to sell their household goods um, to raise money to support themselves. Uh, since this visit, um, a lot of the, the money that was um, kind of released or had been frozen um, by our banks has been um, released for humanitarian purposes, but not all of it for sure. This was a press conference that we did um, at the uh, at the hotel in um, in Afghanistan and and got quite a lot of uh, of good coverage for that. Just to catch us up to date, um, since some of you are you know may have heard about a trip that Amina Mohammed, the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, took very recently, wow. um, where she met with some of the authorities over there. This was a a letter that we had drafted with Religions per, for Peace. Um, where we asked the UN and the Organization of Islamic States, I'm sorry, of Islamic Cooperation 
to, um, you know, to investigate how many households were run by women in, in Afghanistan, because those are the ones that will no longer be able to get humanitarian assistance at all if there are no women working in uh, NGOs, which is what the latest edict was. So the, uh, the opportunity to work together in an interfaith um, context and to, um, you know, to try to raise up these questions of gender equality and elimination of poverty that are so linked, you know, continue today, not only in our own, um, in the United States where I, I operate, but um, around the world. So I know that Indonesia has a big, um, as the world's largest, uh, you know, um, Muslim state with a, a pluralistic outlook, um, a, a, a strong force for good um, among many of our um, of the Muslim states around the world. So thank you so much, and I'd be happy to take questions later. Thank you so much uh, um, for all of this uh, insight that you had given us about the situation for women in Afghanistan. And uh, I would like to share something with you. I'm very aware, obviously, of the situation as most of us are. I belong to, an, to the National Association of Women Judges on the United States and international. And we have met and uh, had invited over the years many judges from Afghanistan that we know personally. And since this happened, we have been trying to bring them outside with their families and so on. Mm -hmm. We have one such family here in, uh, in Queens, actually. And uh, our group, uh, the women judges of the New York area and, and New Jersey, had located a job for her already. And her husband is coming to see me for another job at the UN. So I commend for all of the work you're doing. We are all trying to help the women in Afghanistan. And I have to say that few countries, quite a few actually, uh, you have Qatar, you have UAE, you have Kuwait, they all, all denounced what the Taliban have done because this is un-Islamic and it is uncalled for and these people, this government, this new government, whoever they are, so-called Taliban, they should be in jail for doing what they're doing for women. Uh, after so many years, these young girls and the young women have accomplished so much vis-a-vis -vis education. And it's in their religion. In the Islam, it says for women to be equal to men and to study and so on. Tradition is that you know, who will earn more living, but not the same way the Taliban are doing it. So any help you need from me, I'm here. So <laughs> let me know, I'll be very happy. And I, of course, I know our mutual uh, friend, she had approached me because we're doing something in, uh, during the conference on women, CSW, and we are bringing that subject in as well. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Now we have a, an amazing person who I am very proud to call my friend. And, uh, and I'm sure he is a friend to all of you. He's been a voice uh, in New York City and globally, and we all uh, respect and love him. And I love him and his family and his wife and his kids. So I would like to introduce to you Imam Chemsi Ali. He is the director, Imam, at the Jamaica Muslim Center, Queens, New York. He's the founder and president of Nusantara Foundation. And he is formerly Imam at the Islamic Cultural Center of New York president of Muslim Foundation of America and chairman of the Muslim Day Parade in New York City, where we had also collaborated with you a few years back. He has been face of Islam and Muslims in New York since 9-11 and has been awarded by many institutions, including the United States and New York government, largely for his work in the interfaith 
relationship in U.S. and beyond. There is so much to him that I cannot talk about so much because of time, but I can go on and on and on. So with great pleasure, I would like to introduce Shem Siad. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Aseli. Uh, you and your wonderful husband are uh, really um, a representation of what the Prophet Muhammad said, that khairul nasi anfa'ahum nas. Best uh, humans are the most beneficial to others, to fellow humans. And I think you have ded dedicated your life to that, to benefit as much to others around you, particularly in the interfaith relations uh, buildings. I'm also very proud and honored to be with my with two of my great friends, uh, Reverend Claude Breyer and Rabbi Bob Kaplan. Both are I consider champion of uh, freedom and justice and human rights in New York City and beyond. Uh, um, Rabbi Bob Kaplan has been working with the Muslim community very closely for a long, long time, particularly in the Brooklyn area. And of course, um, uh, Reverend Claude Breyer, we since 9-11, we have been working together. We visited the White House in advancing the Millennium Goals meeting with officials in the White House. And uh, it's, it's really a, a great thing to be here tonight with you, both of you. Um, we must acknowledge, as uh, Rabbi Kaplan mentions, uh, taken from the book, it called Toxic Clarity, that we are living in a very challenging moment at a time. And I think the most um, challenging one is that the very foundation of our happiness and the dispute, peace itself is deeply threatened um, by wars. You mentioned Rabbi Kaplan about wars in Ukraine, um, violent tendencies in different parts of the world, poverty, um, um, you know, climate change and what happened in Turkey just yesterday with many, many thousands of people got killed. All these are situations that basically, you know, coming from um, one particular factor. And, and that factor is what we call human greed. Human greed. Atoma uh, al-insani in Arabic language. The people are so, you know, greedy uh, in a way that they want everything else and them. And human greed are basically caused by um, inability of humans to control their desires. So when our human desires are, uh, are uncontrollable, that will lead into greed. And the Holy Quran, for example, mentioned this very clearly in, the, in chapter number 30, it's called the Romans. Uh, God says, Zahr al fasadu fil barri wal bahri bima kasabat aidin nas, mischief or destruction occurs in the land and in the sea, for what humans hand have done, destructions in different forms, climate change and so on that I mentioned earlier, is because of that human greed, people fail to control their desire and they tend then to transgress in their life. These transgressions is known in Islamic terminology as zulum. Zulum is the opposite of justice. Zulum is oppression or injustice. And that's the very opposite of a justice. So basically, peace, uh, the, threat, the main threat to the peace itself is injustice, it is zulm. Yeah. And zulm is caused by human inability to control their ahwa, their desires. And that's what we see here today, these days, brothers and sisters, my friends, wars and killings, violence against nations and communities, and climate change, as we mentioned earlier, extreme poverty extreme poverty. And this is one of the most important, uh, you know, factor basically that people, you know, become en enemies to one another. I say, you can imagine the economic injustice that we are facing today. Um, as an example, one person owns over $200 billion, over $200 billion, while millions of people don't have anything to eat on a daily basis, no clean water to drink, no shelter to go. While a person owns in his account over $200 billion. And this is being supported by an unjust system that we live in. And it's about all capitals. You know, you want to own more and more and more, and you don't care. This is, brothers and sisters, my friend reminds us 
on the importance of coming back to the essence of religion. What is the essence of religion? The essence of religion, or I, I call it the heart of religion, is human compassion. It is love. It is rahma. The rah All prophets of God had come, in fact, to convey that message that we have to be compassionate to one another. Or Moses, going down to David, Solomon, and others, down to Prophet Jesus, as we believe as Muslims, and Muhammad, peace be upon them. All of them had come as mercy to all humanity. Muhammad is called in the Quran, Rahmatan lil alamin. Dear friends, one of the examples that Islam had come up is, is about the importance of economic justice. And in fact, there is a special chapter in the Quran called Surah Al Ma'un. Surah Al Ma'un. In this chapter of the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God the Almighty, tells us clearly that your religiosity is deeply questionable when you have all these rituals, but you fail to take care of your neighbors. Oh Muhammad, have you seen the one who belies the religion, the one who lies about the faith? It is not about the one who doesn't pray. Yes, praying is very important. It is not the one who is doing fasting. Yes, fasting is very important. But the one who is lying about his religiosity, his faith, while claiming his religion as being religious, is the one who do not care about his neighbors. You know, Reverend Breyer came, went to Afghanistan. That is because he was she was motivated by his her religiosity to take care of those unfortunate women in Afghanistan. And I add my voice to you. And to Sally, that, that is what Islam. Islam is about empowering the marginalized people, including the women. Mm -hmm. Educating uh, woman education is as equal important to the man, to the man, equal important as to the man. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says, "Talabul ilmi farida ala kulli muslimin wa muslimatin." Seeking knowledge is a must, obligatory upon male and female Muslims, mm -hmm. equally. And if anyone who claim to be Muslims and particularly claim to be even more religious, but preventing the woman to learn, it means he is not only in violations of Islam, but he is against the teaching of Islam itself. Dear friends, I just wanted to say that the most dangerous threat to our peace is injustice with all its manifestation. Okay. And therefore we have to, to be just to ourselves. We have to be fair. But let me just say two things here. Number one, we have to be just in judging our faith and our communities. This is number one. Now, why I'm underlining this one? I just wanted to give an example. You know, on the night of the new year, there is um, a breaking news about a young guy happened to be a Caucasian, white, 19 years old, attacked two police officers in Times Square. And that one young guy who was 19 years old, he's now in Bellevue Hospital, so I've seen him. You know, and he claimed to be a comfort, claimed to be a Muslim. And when I woke up in the morning, early in the New Year, every outlet media you know, connected that event to Al-Islam. Muslim radical, Islamic extremism. While they forgot that on the same night, there were two places, mass two shooting took place in, in Georgia and in Florida. But no single religion was mentioned, but Islam, only Islam. This is what I call justice and fairness. You know, Islam is always being dragged. When someone claimed to be Muslim, or sometimes even claimed to be even better Muslim, committing evils and Islam must be the evils. And we have seen this phenomenon since 2001, since 9-11. When those people who claim to be Muslims attack WTC, then Islam has been accused to be terrorism. The second point here, because of the time, is about the importance of being justice and just and proportionate. In a sense that we have to be balanced in understanding many things in life, including many concepts. The, let's say the concept of freedom. Yeah. You know, 
I'm mentioning this because there's an important point that I'd like to underline, the concept of freedom. You know, freedom is certainly noble and everyone uh, advanced freedom. Islam is la ilaha illallah, it means I'm free. No one enslaved me, but God the Almighty and there's freedom. So freedom is very important, but we have to be proportionate in understanding it. Being free doesn't mean that you don't have any limits. Your limitations in freedom when it's, it is violating the right of others. You know, I have a freedom of speech. I have a freedom of speech, I can speak. But when my words are insulting others, that is not freedom. It is an oppression against the rights of others. Why I'm mentioning here, my friends, because oftentimes are insulting others and insulting what others are highly honor and dignify, including religion, including faith, including holy books. They insult holy book in the name of freedom. And that is not a freedom, that is an insult. Freedom by insulting holy book is not freedom. It is an expression of ignorance. It is an expression of hate. In fact, I'm sorry to say this, it is an expression of stupidity. So let me end with this. As Rabbi Kaplan you know, invited us all to build this awareness that we are all together, I just wanted to say that we are living in a very in this, uh, interconnected world. It's called globalized world. No one and no single group can live by themselves without the others. We are connected to one another. So an attack to one is an attack to all. And we must speak for one another. As it is said that enough for evil to thrive when the good people do nothing. So we had to voice out as Reverend Claude Breyer is voicing out her voices in support of the women and the girls in Afghanistan. We have to support one another. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, Imam Shamsi. Uh, very wise words and all of the people here appreciate it and feel the same sentiment. Um, we have our organization, International Federation for Peace and Sustainable Development, have been holding interfaith dialogue since 2001 in December at the church center in our building. Uh, across the street from the main building of the United Nations headquarters. We have hosted several people. We have hosted all religions. We have done interfaith between Muslims and Buddhists um, more than one time. And we have had Christian, Muslim, Jewish women as well. And that we do with the women every year. And uh, for for um, our friend uh, uh, Chloe Breyer, I have to tell you, one year I was looking for priest or rabbi of, uh, as a woman, and I had heck of a time finding one. But we did, we did, and uh, that was in the 2005, six, seven, and so on. And as for the uh, infringing on others and feeling the, the freedom, so-called, to burn uh, holy books and burn Quran, I have to say that in Sweden, where we also have an office there, um, they have behaved obviously very, very badly, but the whole religious community stood with the Muslim community after the burning of Quran. So there is still a lot of good people around that we would like to keep together, all of us, because the most powerful people that we can be to eliminate the hate is to have each other and to support each other, no matter how much or how little we have. Uh, but that's, that's the only way that we can do it. As for what's going on in Turkey and in Syria, I, I'm telling you, this is a hard etching. Uh, it's just amazing. It's just amazing to watch those buildings just drop. And um, it, it is, they said it is the biggest earthquake that they've experienced in over 100 years. 
So we will be doing a drive and I will encourage you, whoever you have there, um, a contact or something, uh, please try to contribute as much as you can to help save um, you know, some of the survivors uh, that are there. And I know the US government is sending some people as well. So this is why we are all in the same place. It's, it's just one world. I cannot emphasize that because we have a tendency of forgetting like mine is the best, my religion is the best, my this is the best, my color, my gender. It isn't, we're all equal, all of us. Well, um, but then you all know that I don't have to tell you this. Uh, now we have a few uh, amazing um, delegates that are wanting to contribute in an intervention. And I will start with um, one of them who happens to be a close friend. He and his wife are very good friends and they are from Australia and they are visiting here in, in New York and we've met them few times at the prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C. And uh, his name is Mr. Joseph Riz. He is the CEO and managing director of the Arab Bank Australia and has been the managing director since 2010. Now he is very, very, very accomplished, but I'm gonna stick to the religious part where he is doing good. Um, he is uh, chairman of the uh, Italian Opera Foundation. He is um, director of Westmead Millennium Institute of Medical Research. He has been awarded in 2015 the Order of Australia. He's a former director of the Australia Arab Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Is the board of uh, the Malachite Catholic Aproki, I would imagine that's a corporation, member of Powerhouse Capital Campaign Committee, and member of the Order of Australia Honors in 2022. He's been awarded honorary doctor from Western Sydney University. I give you the floor so you can share with us a few comments, Joe. Thank you, Sally. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're we right. Okay. Look, I just, you know, um, Sally, thank you um, for the kind invitation. And um, it was lovely catching up with you and Ralph yesterday. And, um, Listening to the guest speakers, uh, to the rabbi, to the reverend, and to the imam, you know, the, the values that we all hold are very, very common. So the reality is that, you know, there is, as, as the rabbi said, there is, is, is a common God that moves across us all. And the reality is um, the focus and the attention that you all give uh is is a great contribution and yes we can be disheartened by the things that are around us but it's the way that we collectively being diverse being being from you know um from different backgrounds sometimes that is an enormous strength that we overlook diversity really is the catalyst for change and people don't really look at that um, in its full focus. Just look at an orchestra. Look at the individual um, contributors to an orchestra. A musician on his own produces lovely music, can produce lovely music. Right. But as a collective, as an orchestra, the results are exceptional. They're extraordinary. And and this is life, this is the reality. This is what makes the smallest of communities function so well. It's the diversity that exists within a small community, be it a village, and the ownership that people take for other people around them. As the Iman has spoken about 
um, your neighbour. You can be fantastic, but if you neglect your neighbour, you are actually neglecting every facet of your values. And I think this is where um, it is paramount for us to understand that collectively, collectively and through diversity, we can make the change. And it's just about maintaining focus as you all do, which is really encouraging to listen to all of you today, including Sally for the great effort. And it's lovely to see the vision of King Abdullah um, and his focus. And if you listen to some of his presentations and some of his speeches, and I've been you know, privileged to have been able to do that, and the focus that he takes right. is just a, a fabulous learning for all of us. But I just want to keep encouraging yourselves. Look, I've, been, I've had the pleasure of being close to Rabbi Zellman uh, in, in, uh, in Australia. And Sally touched on the need for education for children. And what Rabbi Zellman Castell does in, in Australia is enormous. He's introducing um, children from different backgrounds, different faiths, and he's collectively combining uh, gatherings. And I've attended a few of those. And it is so encouraging to see the young working together in an education um, and an understanding of their diversity. Um, but it also is great for the teachers around those students because you're educating the teachers as well. And I think if we always take that focus, we, we achieve things. And um, for me, some of the greatest rewards have been um, with the young people. Every facet of my activities is dealing with young, up and coming students that come from, from, from junior school right through to university. And if we don't take the view of really encouraging them to understand their neighbor, then they are the ones that lose out and we as a whole lose out. But I'd, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, that Rabbi um, you will be speaking. Uh, is, he will be speaking, uh, he's right. with us, and I will, I will end at that. But thank you all, so encouraging, and, and the blessings are enormous. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, well, I would like now to introduce for a short, obviously, uh, intervention from someone we just heard about from his friend here, Joe, and I'm really pleased and honored that he was able to join us uh, this afternoon, this evening. And uh, his name, obviously, as we heard, is Rabbi Zelman Castell. Is the National Director of Together for Humanity. Rabbi Castell was raised in the ultra-Orthodox Hasidic tradition. And um, so he is uh, doing this Judaism, cultural diversity, social cohesion, education, diversity, youth interfaith, interfaith dialogue, religious extremism, prejudice, cross-culture, and so on. You have the floor, uh, Rabbi, please. You have it. Are you with me? Hmm. Rabbi Zalman, are you with me? I did see. Go to the next speaker. Okay, I will. Um, I I thought he was here at the beginning, but we have another intervention from um, another amazing person that we have, and he is Doctor Adib. He's a Lebanese American, is professional engineer, speaks six languages. He is very active in lecturing, engineering, ethics, and religious tolerance. He belongs to numerous honorary professional, civic, and interfaith organizations 
and he is the major speaker at the United Nations Friday sermon um, once a month. So amazing soul, and I would have the honor to have you address us for a few minutes. Thank you, Sally. It's a privilege and honor to be with all these beautiful souls. I can see their pictures. Mm -hmm. I am um, coming after uh, Imam Shamsi Ali with his eloquence. It's going to be sometimes something hard to reach. But nevertheless, I would like to address what you are talking about from a different angle. I'm talking about axioms, like in mathematics. Axioms of our religion. Number one, we are trustees from God on earth. Trustee. Trustee means that God wants us to be like him. We have compassion, we have uh, love, we have uh, uh, understanding, we are tolerant, we are uh, uh, all kinds of good things that we have. That's number one. Number two, that God created this world on a purpose that to be diverse. Diversity is God's will. And when God addressed our beloved prophet, peace be upon him, and all other prophets, he said, if the Lord has will, would have made all humans alike. You cannot change them. So when we are different, it means we are both free to choose. Freedom is the second thing. Since diversity and freedom, that's the third most important thing, is that a verse of the Quran that says, yeah, you have nice, all human beings who have freedom, created you from a single man and woman, Adam and Eve, meaning, and made you into tribes and nations so that you may be acquainted with each other. The heart of you. Acquaintance. Acquaintance means knowing you, knowing your interests, knowing your fears, working with you to make this planet better. And means cooperating, doesn't mean fighting, doesn't mean arguing. It means cooperating to keep this world, this earth, as pristine as God created it. And God asked us to build it, to build this earth. We have done nothing but destroying it, climate-wise, financial-wise, economically, socially. Look at the public space right now. People insult each other. They don't work together. Mm -hmm. And not only that, if you criticize me, I don't defend myself. I say, oh, you hate me. How do you know I hate you? We are sitting inside everybody. If you if I'm accused of accused of something, let me bring the facts. Nobody wants to hear the facts. Everybody is just so we don't have governments to be honest with you, as far as I know. Governments are supposed to serve the people. We have regimes in every country. Mm -hmm. Regimes have the people and they're whatever they like. Government is supposed to help the people, to serve the people. Right. And we have a basic principle in Islam. Whoever asks for a job, run for a job, should not get it. Because they have double standards and whatever. What do we do? It is in Islam. It is a farida, a fard for us to cooperate with others, to recognize the other, to work with others. It's like prayer, like giving charity, like uh, fasting. It is not a choice. I'm not tolerating you, because when I say tolerance, it means something I don't like, and I tolerate. I don't have tolerance. Tolerance towards you. I have affection. Affection is not love. Love has an antony. Affection doesn't have. It has a spiritual component. Unless we have affection for each other, mm -hmm. understanding for each other, helping each other. Today, I read the uh, Ebdo, you know, the magazine in France mm -hmm. that made a lot of problems. 
and they had a caricature of the prophet. They were having on its front page a statement about Turkey. That Turkey is not accepting Sweden and in the uh, in the Atlantic in, in NATO. And they said we don't need tanks to fight Turkey. God has already punished. Wow. When with the earthquake, wow. to find a statement like this is the lowest, the lowest that people can be, even lowest than animals. But in turn in in facing this. We cannot come to this law. We say, may God guide me. May God guide me. What we want to do is recognize each other. And I do a lot of, I'm the chairman of the Interfaith Council of Southwest Connecticut around here. We do a lot of, I go to Seders, we go to high schools, and a rabbi, Josh Hammerman, a cleric by the name of uh, Mark, Mark Lingle, and myself. At the end of every visit, we raise our hands together, showing them the beginning of mankind facing all those dangers that are really facing us. Unfortunately, unfortunately, um, the gods is Rahman, Rahma, which means the grace has become select. We have Rahma for others, we don't have Rahma for others. Mm. It's compassion has been selected, unfortunately. What we have to do, mm. intend and do and say and practice, getting together, accepting mm. each other, have have not compassion, have have kind of not love, but affection for each other. And Thank all you. that and build this point. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Adib. Thank you very much. Um, Imam Shamsi, do you think we would have a few minutes for a question and answer if we have some? We limit ourselves into um, 7.30. Now it's 7.23, so we're going to have seven minutes. On seven that. minutes. I have to say something that I am really amazed we've had we have limited the number of people to participate and I'm, I am really proud and overwhelmed with the numbers that have joined us. Thank you all. So please, if you have any questions, uh, address them to whoever you would like and tell us so. Go ahead. Me? Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Abu Ali, okay, yes. Thank, thank you very much. I have one question. Mm. Treat others the way you want to be treated, and then uh, stronger together, stronger together, right. living together in harmony and peace. My question is: I address uh, to all of the speakers. Do you have some tips how to live together if we do not know each other? Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, how about you, Chloe? Would you like to answer that? Well, we like to start around food. Uh, food is a great way and um, to get to know your neighbor. And I know that in New York, um, something that's become a kind of way mm -hmm. to do interfaith dialogue has been, um, for example, having um, iftar dinners that welcome people of other faith traditions. Um, likewise, uh, Passover seders um, that are uh, welcoming of people of other faith traditions. And, um, and you know, we've, we've got also the, the tradition in Christianity of Maundy Thursday, um, which often involves a uh, a meal and um but really those two things have have uh, particularly the iftars seem to be very popular now and are a, a welcoming way to introduce um conversation and um you know food is often a good way to start and yeah yeah and, and that's very true very true we all want to eat and listen to each other and break bread like they say yeah true yeah any other questions? 
Uh, no, I just wanted to add to that. Um, I think uh, Dr. Adib mentioned the verse in the Quran that all oh, mankind who created you from a male and a female, we met you into many nations and tribes in order for you to get to know one another. Ta'aruf. The word ta'aruf in Arabic is come from the word uruf. It's not only about knowing the names and uh, where he's coming from, but it's deeper than that. It is about living together. And I, I just uh, briefly, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I came to this country in 1996, I rented a house in Astoria, Queens, and my neighbor was an Irish, happened to be a Catholic in religion, Irish background. And, you know, every morning he came out from his house uh, just to say hello to me. And uh, as a person who had never met non-Muslims a lot before came to this country, you know, we have a lot of suspicion in the minds. But, you know, he insisted to come and say hello, smiling every day. And that interaction basically changed my mind that, you know, we have our individuality. I'm, I, I'm a Muslim. He's a Catholic. But you know what? He's a human being. I'm a human being. And that humanity connect us. And that is true ta'aruf. So ta'aruf is not only coming together. And unfortunately, many people, when they, when they, when they heard about interfaith, they thought about discussion and dialogue, leader to leader, <laughs> of academic. No, 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 no. Here in New York, we organize, we organize in the past what we call midnight run, organized by Muslim, Jews, and Christians, feeling homeless in, in the winter season, in the middle of the night. I still remember when the, uh, a Jewish you know, uh, student from um, GTS, not GT, yeah, GTS, with um, a youth group from 96th Street Mosque, went out to the street distributing a, a hot sandwich in the middle, in the street of Manhattan. And when we hand over that sandwich to homeless, they see the Muslim with head and they're Jewish with kippah. And they say, huh? Uh, we do it, right? You're Muslim. How, how is this possible for you to come together? But that is the reality. That is interfaith. That is what interfaith yeah. is about. So Ta'aruf is living the life with our own particularities, but willing to go beyond. Yes. Any other question? We have a minute or so. Go ahead. <laughs> no more. Well, because we limited them because we have to leave. Um, it, it was uh, delightful to see you, Joe, is it? And I don't know what happened to uh, the uh, rabbi. Uh, did you manage to find where he is? You know, he is in Australia. Sally, yes, I did um, uh, touch base with him. He had he had a limited time. He yeah. was there for the majority of the uh, yeah, I saw the, that. the presentations yeah. and speakers, yeah. and yeah. he will he will make contact with you. And I think yeah. it is important to uh, um, to share his contact details with those that are interested. Yes. But his yes. fabulous work that he's doing, fabulous work. Definitely, because I and, did see him, and then uh, I figured there yes. must be something. To do yeah, he time. he had limited he had limited time, Absolutely. but um, but he he okay. he sent me a, an email, and he basically said he'd he'd love to make contact. He does come to New York um, yeah. on a regular basis um, with relatives here and so forth, but um, it'll be a great opportunity to link up with him when he's here next Absolutely. time. Absolutely, Absolutely. Imam uh, Hamsi, can you close it with the uh, dua? Yeah. First, let me thank everybody uh, for being here this evening. And I am flabbergasted that we had so many wonderful people joining us from many countries. And I see my dear, dear friend from Germany, from Berlin. Uh, Berlin how are you, my dear? I'm glad you are joining us here. And I have to mention that uh, Katerina, her daughter, she is studying uh, at the university in Berlin all about Islam. She speaks and writes and reads better than I ever did Arabic. And uh, she's doing a lot of research about the contribution that the uh, Arabs and Muslims did vis-a-vis -vis science and all of the other things that they have done and, and uh, medicine and so on. So please give her my regard. I thank you all for being here with us. We really pull this. Thank you, Imam Shamsi, uh, because I did see uh, the King Abdullah this last time. 
few days ago, actually, at the prayer breakfast where he did address uh, the prayer breakfast group. And uh, he, he started something and uh, I had promised him when he first announced it that I will be doing my best to do whatever I can to be part of this because it is something that we all believe in. And my partner in, in crime is Imam Shamsi. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been doing this uh, in different forms and locations and I've partnered with many people, including the Vatican uh, since 2006. And uh, and we did something together with the rabbis and uh, 2008 and so on and so forth at, the, and at my platform, which is the United Nations. I uh, welcome all of you, please feel free to get in touch with us. Uh, you all know our uh, emails and addresses, I hope. And uh, Imam Shamsi, you know who, where he is. And uh, and you can reach me anytime. And we be really awesome to stay in touch with each other. I thank you again. And I would pass it now, the floor to Imam Shamsi to guide us into a prayer. Well, thank you again, Sally. Thank you again for your leadership. And um, of course, your wonderful husband, Ralph, uh, you know, on this. See, men stick together all the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, um, you know, uh, dear friends, as you, uh, all of you know that what's going on in uh, Turkey and uh, part of Syria, yeah. I think our heart is with them, with the people there. And so we'd like to end this event with a uh, silent prayer. In the Muslim tradition, we are going to recite Surat al-Fatiha and in any faith tradition, you have your own tradition, please do pray for them. They need at least our prayer, but we have to do every possible way to help them, inshallah. Many, many organizations are doing great things. So mm -hmm. in any capacity, please do your part to help, you know, to ease their burdens and difficulties. May Allah make, uh, help them. So for Muslims, and uh, let's recite Surat al-Fatiha. A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين كنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Thank you so very much again and have a wonderful night for those who are in the United States and wonderful morning those who are in Indonesia I don't know what's time in Australia uh, enjoy the rest of the time thank you Salaam alaikum. Thank you. Salaam alaikum. Salaam. Bye. 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 Bye.